a graduate student who was like that, she did a series. And Mario Kibo, one of the comic members, who nominated also this work here. And although the name suggests it's a dangerous talk, maybe, <laughs> I hope it's quite interesting. Uh, his advisor is Damian uh, Chapman, and he will take over <laughs> for the introduction of this hopefully quite Definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> really good <laughs> talk. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Damian Chapman. I'm assistant professor at uh, the School of Marine and Atmospheric Science here at Stony Brook, SOMAS. And it's my very, very pleasure to introduce my uh, PhD student, Mark Vaughan. Uh, Mark is, what, three years into his PhD? Yeah, just started Actually, there, really five because he's been working with me for two years before that. Uh, he came to us from uh, Cardiff, Cardiff University, uh, which is in Wales. And uh, he said he got his undergraduate degree in marine geography. And he's been working with me in Belize for about five years, and he's been presenting uh, uh, his research. All right, thanks very much. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming. So thanks to uh, programs like Shark Week and uh, the explosion in the cage diving industry, South Africa's, one of South Africa's most famous icons at the moment is the great white shark. In fact, let me change that. Not the most famous, obviously. Oh, the most famous would be Nelson Mandela. <laughs> so <clears throat> it, would seem, it would seem intuitive, given this, that um, growing up in South Africa, I'd want to always come and study sharks. But however, when I was a kid, in Cape Town, uh, doing a lot of surfing and kayaking, I did everything in my power to actually actively avoid sharks, especially when I was in the water. Um, it was only once I moved to the Bahamas and started working in a research station there that I um, truly kind of appreciated how amazing these creatures were and wanted to work with them. Unfortunately, not everybody agrees with me, and shark populations globally are in steep decline. This is mainly due to intense fishing pressure, both commercially, where they are targeted themselves for the high-valued fins and meat, and also where they are taken as incidental bycatch for the tuna and swordfish fisheries. Um, habitat degradation uh, resulting from human development of coastlines and also pollutions leaking into the marine environment are also impacting their chance for survival. The high price that is now sought for the shark fins, that is a delicacy in Asia for shark fin soup, also increases the fact that a lot of people are actually commercially focusing on sharks to try and get those high prices for the fins. Um, a lot of species of fish that we see today are actually kind of deemed to be overfished or in trouble, but the reason that sharks deserve particular importance is they are particularly susceptible to overexploitation. This is due to the fact that life history traits such as slow growth, late maturity, um, low fecundity, which basically means they have very few pups at one go. Um, years between um, pregnancies mean that they are uh, slow to recover if heavily impacted. So in Belize, there is a commercial shark fishery. Uh, the two primary methods for fishing are gill nets, which you can see in the top right here. Um, that's basically a stretch of monofilament meshing that is stretched either within the water column or set down at the bottom. The shark swims into it, gets tangled up around its gills, and obviously suffocates and drowns. Um, the second method would be long lines, which consist of one main long line with multiple baited hooks. The shark swims up, goes for the bait, obviously, gets himself hooked, and then obviously resultingly gets catched, uh, caught. Um, unfortunately, both of these methods are used to target sharks, but they also have high incidental rates of bycatch. Species like uh, turtles and dolphins are sometimes caught. Although the process or practice of finning is uh, kind of highly controversial at the moment and a lot of governments are working to try and ban it, um, Belize doesn't suffer from finning. The whole shark is landed and they actually are consumptive in the fact that they use the whole species. The meat is dried and salted and used for shark, um, sorry, fish sandwiches, uh, particularly at Easter time for Lent. Uh, the fins are harvested and used for the shark fin soup. Um, jaws are sold as curios and the liver oil is um, produced and used in cooking and as a nutritional supplement. So along with the commercial shark fishery, uh, Belize also has a network of marine reserves. Um, a marine reserve is essentially an area, a marine area that is restricted by law and prohibits or limits the use of 
um, human activities within it. Um, the goals of marine reserves can be for the conservation of a particular species or the protection of a valuable habitat. Um, the motivation for establishing these reserves, however, can differ. They can be ecological, which is what most people assume, um, to protect species that are endangered or, again, protect those critical habitats. Um, they could be economic. From a fishery standpoint, a marine reserve can be set up to prevent stock collapse and to allow the fish that have um, regenerated within the reserve boundaries to spill over outside of the reserve and to increase the yield of that fishery. Another economic benefit of marine reserves is from um, ecotourism. So you can have shark diving or shark dives, which have now become very popular. Also just recreational scuba diving um, and other activities that bring an income to the country. From a social point of view, they can be used to protect uh, traditional cultural heritage and also to be used through education and outreach. However, just stating that an area is a marine reserve is not always sufficient for it to be a successful marine reserve. For it to be really successful, it needs to be effectively enforced. Um, because, as we all know, a lot of people that are trying to take things from the marine environment are doing so without um, pro uh, professional licenses and things like that. So by having a, an effective enforcement, it allows the marine reserve to function as it's supposed to. So what are the biological benefits of a marine reserve? So fish, invertebrates and seaweeds have been found to express an increase in the following when, found when comparing inside marine reserves to outside marine reserves. Biomass, which basically just means the general weight of whatever species you're examining. The density, as in the number per given a specific area. The body size, which is pr pretty straightforward. And the biodiversity, which is the number or the variation of the number of species inside. However, looking at marine reserves from this standpoint, we can see that the species that these studies have been performed on are generally quite slow moving or sedentary in the fact that they don't move in great areas throughout their life. They kind of stay in one particular area and utilize this area which is defined as a home range. So what we wanted to look at is how would a marine reserve benefit a highly mobile species like a shark or a ray. So in Belize, the efforts for shark conservation, so sharks are commercially targeted. There is no specific shark management plan as of yet, although we're currently working with the Department of Fisheries down there to try and implement one. Um, marine reserves are used increasingly as a conservation tool in Belize, and we wanted to see how effective they are in helping to conserve sharks that we know are highly mobile and can move in and out in great distances at, at, at their will. So the hypothesis that we wanted to test are, are reef sharks residential enough to be enhanced by marine reserves. Unfortunately, we can't just call the sharks and tell them it's better for you to stay inside this marine reserve. There is an offense that keeps them in, so they can move wherever they want. But we wanted to see, are they moving in these grand, uh, at, at these grand scales to the point where they're spending most of their time outside of the protective boundary of the reserve, or are they spending most of their time inside and therefore benefiting from the redu uh, reduction in fishing pressure? We also predicted that they would be more abundant, as in there would be more sharks inside marine reserves when compared to fish reefs. So to try and study this, uh, we conducted a study at Glover's Reef Marine Reserve in Belize. Belize is in Central America, just below the Yucatan Peninsula. And uh, it's, uh, Glover's Reef is a coral atoll that is about 45 kilometers off the mainland of Belize. Um, it encompasses, the reserve itself encompasses mangrove, seagrass, and coral habitats. So that's deemed to be quite an effective source because you want to cover as many habitats that the species in protection is going to use. Um, and the reserve itself was established in 1993. It was effectively enforced in 1998 with the development of a permanent Government of Belize Fisheries Department station on one of the islands of the atoll. Uh, and they protect or enforce the reserve rules and regulations through routine patrols. And they have an observation tower that allows them to see the expanse of the no-take zone. So Glover's Reef has unique. Is this the, the hatched area? Just, yeah, just getting that out. Um, so the no-take, the Glover's Reef is zoned in two different ways, and that's what makes it a unique study site. So the hashed areas that we're looking at um, are the traditional no-take, as in there is no removing of any living resource within that area. You have the main body of the no-take that we can see at the bottom, and in the top right you have a spawning aggregation for the um, Nassau grouper, which is another species that is requiring protection at, the, at, at present. However, so this is great. This is the traditional no-take marine reserve that we expect. However, if you look around the whole atoll, you see the, the hashed line. 
and that designates the, the zone that's called the general use zone. And within the general use zone, it prohibits the use of gill nets and long lines. So we know that those are the two primary methods used for shark fishing. So by having those two methods completely forbidden without the entire expanse of the atoll, it lends this uh, site to being a good place to conduct our research and hopefully as a good kind of uh, icon for shark conservation. So to try and answer the question of whether or not they, were resi they are residential enough, uh, we used acoustic telemetry. So sharks were implanted, uh, surgically implanted with acoustic tags. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, sutures, sorry, the incisions were sutured up to make sure that there was no bleeding. Um, and an array of underwater receivers or listening stations were set up around the atoll. Those are indicated by the red dots on this map. The black triangle is the, uh, the no-take zone that we saw from the last map. So the receivers work in a unique way. Each of the acoustic tags has a unique code, so a unique four-digit number. And so in our little animation here, this shark has been in, uh, implanted with a tag. The receiver is the red dot, and the circle that you can see encompassing the red dot of the receiver is the detection range. So this will vary depending on the habitat type, but it's approximately about 300 to 500 meters. So our shark with our tag swims into the detection range. The receiver detects that it's shark 3348, and it detects the time and the date that that shark was in that area. So using this acoustic data, we can map the movements of sharks within our array. So looking on a small scale, here we've grouped uh, the telemetry data into three sections. Um, and what these sections show is that where you see the initials, that is the point of capture uh, of the individuals that generated this information. So what we can see is that individuals generally spend most of their time in specific areas of the atoll. Even though they have the whole atoll to utilize, they spend most of their time in specific areas, which is where we happen to have caught them. And these are called home ranges. So it's great because we show that, yes, OK, sharks are using specific areas of the atoll. Some venture off and use the entire atoll. But what we want to do is to see if they're using this part of the atoll the whole year round. As in, we want to see if there's m maybe mass migrations or seasonal migrations or migrations as they get older and they can swim further distances. And that's obviously going to move them out of that protective boundary and, and impact the effectiveness of the reserve. So to look at this, we wanted to look at reef shark residency. So if we look at one individual reef shark at this moment in time, so the shark, the number on the left indicates the individual shark, so that is the transmitter number. Um, so one number is one individual shark and one um, horizontal line is just one individual. The, uh, the top line indicates the month of the year, so just a calendar month running from January to December. And the squares indicate a code or the number of days detected per month. So if there is a square under the calendar month, then we know that it was detected between zero and seven days of that month. If the square is gray, then it was detected between seven and 14 days of that calendar month. And if there's greater than 14 days detection for that month, then the square is black. So now if we expand this and we look at all 34 individuals that we used, that were tagged for this study, we can see that in general, if you were to pass a, pass a sweeping statement over this, yes, we have a couple of individuals that vary, but in generally, almost all of our sharks were detected at some point of every month of the year. So that's indicating that, no, there isn't a mass seasonal migration. They're not in the reserve or in this area for six months, and then they move out and come back. They're generally resident within this atoll for the whole year. Yes, it's possible that given the days of detection that they could make migrations outside of the reserve, but there aren't any of these mass migrations that would kind of impact the effectiveness. So if we go back to our original statement, reef sharks are residential enough to be enhanced by marine reserves. So now we wanted to look at our prediction. Are they more abundant inside marine reserves when compared to similar <coughs> fished reefs? So to answer that, we use the technique called baited remote underwater video, or BRUD. Now, I've, <coughs> excuse me. I've, uh, I've expressed to my friends in South Africa what I do on numerous occasions. And the other, a couple of months back, I got an email from my friend. He said, oh, we saw a picture of, uh, of the kind of the techniques that you're using to do your research. And I was like, oh, great, send it through to me. And he sent me that. That is not what I do. We do not use the cameras as bait. Our setup looks kind of like this, and I'll go into that in more detail on the next slide. However, baited remote underwater video, or chum cam as they're effectively known, 
um, is a non-invasive sampling technique. It's non-invasive in the fact that we never have to catch the shark. We merely film them and use this as a count of relative abundance. Um, because there is no human presence, as is with traditional surveys of diver surveys or transect surveys, there's no diver bias, so that removes it. So we should hopefully get a more reflective, um, more accurate reflection of the abundance. Um, sites for these deployments are randomly generated using GIS software. They're deployed on the fore reef between 20 and 85 feet in depth, um, and each video records for 85 minutes continuously. Now, prior to the camera being deployed and after it has been hauled, we measure environmental parameters that include salinity, dissolved oxygen, water temperature, and flow velocity to see if those have any influence on shark relative abundance. Uh, for the purpose of this study, one video equals one sample. So a closer look at our rig. We have the, uh, the traditional kind of triangle shaped frame that's made of uh, steel rebar. We use the triangle frame for stability. Uh, inside the camera housing is just your generic kind of standard home uh, video camera, um, but obviously the waterproof housing enables it to go down to these depths. Um, extending in front of that, we have the arm with the bait cage on it. Uh, in the bait cage, we have a standard source of one kilogram of chopped up sardines. We use the standard source so that there's no bias coming from that. Um, and the whole frame itself is tethered to the surface via a line with a small surface float that aids in recovery so that we don't always have to go back into the water to bring the frames up when they finish recording. So to set these frames, we pull up to the point uh, and then we get into the water and we look for a sandy bottom area that's kind of relatively flat. We don't want to obviously drop it on any corals and damage those and we want to use a relatively flat area because it maximizes our field of view. We orientate the frame into the current with the idea that the current will carry the smell of the bait off into the water column and anything that smells it and that is interested will follow the odor corridor back up and then find itself in front of the camera, therefore being filmed. So we uh, perform the, uh, the BRUV or the CHUM CAM surveys at four sites. We are uh, back at Glover's Reef where we did the tracking. Uh, then we had a second reserve at Key Corker, um, further up on the main body of the barrier reef. Uh, we have Turnif, which is a fished atoll, again away from the body of the barrier reef. And our fourth uh, fish site was Southwater Key. Now the interesting thing about Southwater Key is for the purpose of this study it is a fish site, but it is now actually a marine reserve and it is being actively enforced itself. So we started surveying this area prior to it being established as a reserve and we will continue to service it, um, survey it into the future with the idea that hopefully we'll be able to see over time a change in um, biomass, density, biodiversity, those kind of those biological parameters that we identified at first. Um, and that will give us an indication of how long an area takes to recover pro after it's being fished once it's been designated a reserve. So that's quite exciting. But for the purpose of this study, it's a fish site. So here we go, this is what everybody comes for, the videos. So this is uh, just a couple of clips to show how we analyze the data. Okay, so obviously at the moment we're looking at the bait cage. Um, we have juvenile Caribbean reef sharks coming into the picture. Now we take three different scores of relative abundance. We have the first, which is a binary presence or absence. Are there sharks on the video at any point? Yes, okay, presence is there. So that's a straight yes or no. The second count we take is max A, and that is the maximum number of sharks on screen at one single moment throughout the video. So for this video, as it plays towards the end, this would be a max A of three, because there are three reef sharks on screen at one single moment in time. Now this is great, and it's hard to tell individuals apart, because obviously we don't have the tags on these videos, and sometimes we can't see them at that length. So what we do is we then look for distinguishing features. So sometimes they'll swim over the camera and we'll be able to sex them. Sometimes they'll swim in line with the bait cage so we're able to get an estimate of size. Um, and sometimes they'll have distinctive markings like tears in their fins. So that enables us to also distinguish individuals from each other and that prov provides us with max B which is the maximum number of sharks we think we've seen, individuals that is, throughout the duration of the whole tape. So we've got max A, which is just maximum number on screen at once, and then max B, which is the maximum number that we've seen throughout the whole tape. Um, as you can see here, so this is inside the marine reserve. We've got quite a nice um, abundance of fish. The fish are of a decent size. Down at the bottom there, we have one of those Nassau grouper. That is the species that was, um, had its own speci uh, spe specified um, kind of no-take area around its spawning aggregation to protect that. So uh, yeah, it's really kind of 
a nice, healthy environment. We've got a lot of biodiversity. We've got sharks, Nassau grouper, yellowtail snapper. In the background, we have triggerfish. So it's kind of a, a reflection of what we would see in a reserve. If we look at another reserve, this is key corker. Here we're looking at a nurse shark. Um, people always like the nurse sharks because they do this interesting thing. Their mouths are on the underside of their jaws as opposed to the front, like the reef sharks. So they turn themselves upside down like this and they use their jaw to suck the bait out of the cage. So of all the shark species that we encounter, the nurse sharks actually get the most reward out of this. So uh, it's pretty interesting because sometimes they'll, uh, they'll spend literally 45 minutes under, on their backs just sucking away trying to get to the bait. Um, we have had uh, instances where we had to change the way that the cage was attached because the nurse sharks were able to rip it off because they're quite strong. Now, like I said before, this is an unobtrusive sampling technique. So it means that we don't have bycatch I shouldn't say we don't have bycatch because we once had a, uh, a moray eel swim into the cage that caused a bit of chaos once we brought the cage back onto the boat. But uh, he was returned safely. And, uh, but obviously we don't have the risk of mortality that we have with traditional capture and release methods. So now if we look at one of the fish sites, that's what we're looking at. I promise you the video is playing. If you look here, you'll see the, uh, a small fish in the background. Now, unfortunately, this is kind of, if commercial fishing is allowed to take place, this is potentially what we could see throughout the whole Barrier Reef. So it's really good and really proactive of Belize to establish this network of reserves because they want to make sure that, yes, obviously the fishermen need somewhere for them to fish, but at the same time, they want to make sure that they can um, ensure the sustainability of their, uh, of their marine environment for the future. So what did we see? We conducted 50 bruvs at each of those four sites, so 200 tapes in total. Um, of the Caribbean reef shark, which is the top predator in this environment, um, and also the species that we use for the tracking study. They were found at, or they were present at all of the four sites, and we saw, oh, we saw a total of 34 Caribbean reef sharks throughout the, to uh, the 200 tapes. If we look for nurse sharks, again, they were present at all four sites, and we saw a total of 51 nurse sharks. Uh, 51 videos of the 200 had nurse sharks present. The lemon shark, Unfortunately, didn't do so well, and there was only one of those guys. So uh, yeah, lemon sharks might need to, uh, need to boost up the numbers. And Caribbean sharp nose, they were found at two of the sites, a reserve at Corker and a fish site at Southwater. But again, there was only two of those. So for the purpose of this study, we're going to ignore the Caribbean sharp nose shark and the lemon shark, just because the sample size was uh, insufficient. Um, and we're going to ignore the nurse sharks because they're actually a mid-level predator as opposed to a top predator or a meso predator. So from the stingray point of view, uh, the southern stingrays, here we go, uh, southern stingrays were present at all four sites um, and a total of 35 tapes of the 200 um, had stingrays, southern stingrays on them. Um, spotted eagle rays were present at all four sites of the total of 21 videos. And Caribbean whiptail ray, or the Hymentura, was found at two sites and only had a total of two. Now, for the rest of the study, we're also going to ignore the spotted eagle ray because they don't actually respond to the bait in the same way that the other two ray species do. Um, so the fact, the, obs the observations we've seen of the spotted eagle rays have actually just been opportunistic as they've just been swimming by the point of the camera. So let's look for the analysis. So we fed all of our results into a delta log normal generalized linear model. Um, and we put in the factors of marine reserve, uh, location nested mar within marine reserve, so differentiating between the two reserves, um, habitat, um, and the environmental parameters that I uh, alluded to earlier. Uh, the study consisted of over 17,200 minutes of footage. So I never thought I'd watch so much TV while I was doing my PhD, but here you go. Uh, the pictures show some other interesting things that we saw while we were, uh, while we were looking for the sharks. We've got a big school of dog snapper, bar jacks, another good predator on the fish, uh, on the reef rather, uh, tarpon, and then barracuda at the bottom. So the results. Now just looking at reef sharks, as we've said now, because they filled that top predator guild. Um, if we focus just on the marine reserves, if we look at glovers and corker, so of the 50 tapes, this is out of 50 tapes for each, uh, each location, uh, 15 of the 50 had sharks present at Glovers, and 11 of the 50 had sharks present at Corker. Now, if we look at Turniff, out of 50 tapes, only six sharks were found. Uh, only six tapes had sharks on them, and at Southwater, only a measly two. So, when we look at this and we feed this into the model, 
we find that the only factor that had any significance over the presence of reef sharks in, these, in this survey was marine reserves. So that means we could discount environmental parameters and other things as being the driver of this pattern. Now the reason that that bar graph is split into two colors is of those 15, six of those videos had more than one shark on them. So this is a very conservative estimate. If we were looking at individuals of sharks as opposed to just presence or absence on the tape, then those bars would be higher, which would further support our point. So if we go back to our prediction, yes, it seems that marine reserves do have a higher abundance or there are more sharks inside marine reserves. So what about the rays? Now we're looking at exactly the same graph that we've just looked at for the sharks, but if we now want to look below and we see the, uh, the rays, so the um, southern stingray and the high mature rays for the same four sites, again out of 50 tapes. Now the important thing to notice is that uh, rays aren't commercially targeted. So whereas what we would have expected is to not see a reserve effect, as in we wouldn't have expected to see that rays benefit by reserves because there's nothing apart from natural predation, humans aren't trying to remove them from the ecosystem, but instead we see a complete reversal of this pattern. And in marine reserves, where we thought there would be no difference, there is significantly fewer rays when compared to similar fished habitats. And again, we put this into our, um, our GLM model, or our linear model, and we found that the only thing that had any bearance, uh, bearing on ray presence was um, the fact of marine reserve. And again, this had a negative influence. So in areas where we saw positive influence for sharks, we're seeing a ne negative influence for rays and vice versa. So that's kind of interesting and kind of led us to think, well, what is driving this pattern? Could it potentially be that the removal of sharks are releasing rays from predation because we do know that Caribbean reef sharks do eat rays. They've been found in stomach contents and of personal observations I've seen uh, rays being harassed by reef sharks on the pat reefs. So if it's predation that is driving this pattern, oh hang on, I'm getting ahead of myself. So just for the next part of this study, I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So I'm going to be talking about two different habitats, the lagoon and the fore reef. So the, the main body of the barrier reef runs between the two, and the lagoon is um, on the, usually on the left-hand side, and the fore reef is on the right-hand side. Now remember from the previous study where we've deployed the cameras, all of those cameras were deployed on the fore reef. So all of the results we've seen thus far have been based on fore reef. So now, if it was direct predation, or if it's the fact that sharks, the sharks are actively removing the rays from the marine reserves by eating them, and that's why we're seeing a few, uh, fewer numbers there, then what we would expect is that we would see that same pattern across all habitats within the reserve. So the sharks would be eating rays both on the fore reef and in the lagoon, and so we would just see generally when comparing the reserve to the fish side, fewer rays inside the fish uh, reserve when versus the fish side. So this is what we expected to see, the reflection of this pattern between the fore reef, which is on the right, and the lagoon, which is on the left, separated by the re uh, reef crest. So to analyze this, we conducted boat-based stingray transects. Each transect was 500 meters long. We have between six and 10 people, two permanent on the boat to ensure uh, standardization. And again, these were selected randomly using GIS, and they covered a depth range of between 3.5 and 17.6 feet. Uh, they covered a variety of tidal states, and the environmental parameters that were measured were water temperature and dissolved oxygen. So when looking at the results of these, if we look um, of the total 42 surveys, we counted 163 rays, rays inside the lagoon at Glovers, and at South Water inside the lagoon, we saw 64 stingrays out of 40 surveys which gave us an average of 3.8 stingrays per transect at Glovers and 1.6 stingrays per transect at Southwater. Now, this, uh, the t-test showed that these were significantly different. So now if we go back to our original hypothesis, what we saw, so this is the kind of the image that we got when we just looked on the fore reef from the bruvs. We saw fewer rays inside the reserve when compared to the fish reef. Based on our assumption that this was based on um, sharks directly removing them from the ecosystem, we would have expected to see the same pattern inside the lagoon that we saw on the fore reef. Now, if we just forget everything we've seen about the fore reef and just focus on the lagoon, so this was the pattern we would have expected sh should this be driven by direct predation. But this is, in fact, what we found inside the reserve. We saw more in the lagoon, and on the fish reef, we saw fewer inside the lagoon. So that also kind of discounted the fact that there was no, there's that hypothesis that there are fewer rays in all habitats is not true. So what are the potential mechanisms of this? 
Um, Rays are selecting safer habitats inside the reserve. We know from our longline surveys that we don't catch uh, sharks inside these shallows in the lagoon flats. So we know that if shark presence is, the f is driving uh, this pattern through fear, then they are dif differentially choosing to leave the, the, the more intimidating environment of the fore reef where there are higher shark um, presence and moving into the safer lagoon where there's lower shark presence. So that's causing a behavioral shift and creating this differential distribution between the two habitats while within the reserve. Um, potentially this pattern is driven by competition for prey within the reserve. Maybe there is, um, w on the fore reef, there is something that eats the same thing as the rays and the rays just can't get a look in. So they're having to move from the fore reef into the lagoon just so that they can get enough food to survive. Or potentially it's driven by habitat. So habitat micro differences. Um, or micro differences in habitat. So stingrays prefer soft bottom sediment or soft bottom substrate because it allows them to bury themselves to hide and also allows them to um, disturb the sediment to dig for food. So if there is more soft bottom at one of these sites compared to the other, then maybe that is what's driving this pattern. So we want to investigate that. So the differential dif distribution is the stingrays moving from the fore reef into the lagoon. So future work that we're going to do to try and answer these and to, to figure out what is actually driving this pattern is we're going to do lagoon-based brubs. So we're going to use the same method that we used on the fore reef and deploy it inside the lagoon to see if we're seeing the same pattern in abundance using a standardized method of, of survey. Um, that's what you're seeing at the bottom here, a little clip from Glover's Reef. Um, so we're going to put 40 of those in each site. Uh, we'll do stable isotope analysis from samples at both, both sites to see if there's potentially an overlap. So that will help us distinguish whether it's competition for food. Because if we look at the trophic web and we see that there's something on the same level, as in level of the food web as the stingrays, and that there's a, a higher abundance of those, potentially they're the species that are bullying the rays off the fore reef into the lagoon. Um, and we're also going to look at benthic fauna surveys because maybe there is just a lot more food for the rays inside the lagoon than on the fore reef and they're not actually choosing it over fear at all, they're just moving in because that's where most of their food is. So these are all surveys that we're, uh, we're intending to work through at the moment to try and figure this out. Uh, again, we'll conduct fine scale resolution survey, um, fine scale habitat surveys to see if we're seeing that predominant of maybe soft bottom over hard bottom that again could um, generate this pattern because soft bottom has increased refuge. So what are the broader implications for this? Why do we care? So obviously stingrays aren't commercially important because otherwise that could potentially be what was driving this pattern. However, stingrays and eagle rays predate on commercially important species such as conch and lobster and things that people actually really do care about because there's a lot of money in it and there's a lot of food and people obviously like conch and lobster so they want to have a lot of them around. There's a lot of conservation efforts going into making sure those populations are stable. So if we're pr putting a reserve in place and it's upsetting this balance, then that's obviously something that people are going to want to care about. Also, there are ecological consequence consequences of having more stingrays in an environment. So like we just identified, the reduction of commercially important species such as conch and lobster. Um, however, seagrass, um, stingrays also impact on the seagrass community. On the bottom picture on the right here, um, you can see that is a seagrass bed that has been highly disturbed by stingray foraging. So they've gone in, they've looked for their food source within the seagrass beds, they've disturbed and they've actually torn up the seagrass and created these feeding pits. Um, and in the process of doing that, they actually change the chemical composition of that environment because they resuspend sediment that is going through chemical processes deep underneath. So diagenesis is going on underneath the sediment and it's expected to never come back to the top. But with these stingrays digging in and bioturbating and putting all of the sediment back up into the water column, then that's changing the chemical composition. And obviously spe uh, species that are inside the seagrass at the time that it's being destroyed or being eaten by an increased presence of stingrays are obviously going to be influenced too. So in conclusion, uh, based on the work that we've done so far and hopefully continue to do in the future, uh, we were able to show that Caribbean reef sharks are residential at Glovers, as in there is no m big seasonal migration. They don't move in at one time of the year. Um, there was a higher abundance of them inside marine reserves, whether that is because of reduced fishing pressure, as in they're staying inside there um, and there's more inside there because there's less fishing, or maybe it's they're inside there more because there's more of their food because there's less fishing of their prey. So we're going to try and hopefully figure that one out in the future. 
Um, we also saw that stingray abundance is lower inside marine reserves and we're working on trying to work out the, uh, the driving pattern for that one. Um, and that obviously has potential impacts for the commercially important uh, species like conch and lobster and also the seagrass community. So with that I'd like to thank my co-authors, my advisor Damien, uh, Beth Babcock from Miami, uh, Ellen Pickett from SOMAS, uh, Captain Norlin and Bert who are the two people pictured, captains on the left. Uh, without those guys, I definitely wouldn't have been able to get half of this stuff done, so they're uh, eternally grateful. Uh, Jasmine, my lab mate, who's out in the field with me helping. Um, Debbie, who helped logistically and uh, with input. Um, and Earthwatch volunteers that come out and help conduct this field work and bring the, uh, bring the financial support in. And uh, to my small army of SOMAS undergrads that helped me go through the mountains and mountains of videos I think we've got 324 left to go before we, stay, before we take more next year, so we've got to try and catch up on that. Uh, from a funding standpoint, I'd like to thank the Institute for Ocean Conservation Science, uh, Wildlife Conservation Society, the Belize Department of Fisheries, who we're hoping to work with in the future in implementing that management plan, and the Roe Foundation. And with that, I'd like to take any questions. Mm -hmm.